Welcome to Bookmarked Book Club. Today we're going to be reading a few chapters from the wonderful book The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. It's about a bored young boy named Milo who goes on a hilarious adventure after going through a mysterious tollbooth that suddenly appears in his room. Throughout the video I'm going to put up illustrations by the great Jules Pfeiffer. So what are we waiting for? Let's get going. The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. Chapter 1 Milo. There was once a boy named Milo who didn't know what to do with himself, not just sometimes, but always. When he was in school, he longed to be out, and when he was out, he longed to be in. On the way, he thought about coming home, and coming home, he thought about going. Wherever he was, he wished he were somewhere else, and when he got there, he wondered why he'd bothered. Nothing really interested him least of all the things that should have. It seems to me that almost everything is a waste of time, he remarked one day as he walked dejectedly home from school. I can't see the point in learning to solve useless problems or subtracting turnips from turnips or knowing where Ethiopia is or how to spell February. And since no one bothered to explain otherwise, he regarded the process of seeking knowledge as the greatest waste of time of all. As he and his unhappy thoughts hurried along, for while he was never anxious to be where he was going, he liked to get there as quickly as possible. It seemed a great wonder that the world, which was so large, could sometimes feel so small and empty. And worst of all, he continued sadly, there's nothing for me to do, nowhere I'd care to go, and hardly anything worth seeing. He punctuated this last thought with such a deep sigh that a house sparrow singing nearby stopped and rushed home to be with his family. Without stopping or looking up, Milo dashed past the buildings and busy shops that lined the street and in a few minutes reached home, dashed through the lobby, hopped onto the elevator, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and off again, opened the apartment door, rushed into his room, flopped dejectedly into a chair and grumbled softly, Another long afternoon. He looked glumly at all the things he owned. The books that were too much trouble to read, the tools he'd never learned to use, the small electric automobile he hadn't driven in months or was it years, and the hundreds of other games and toys and bats and balls and bits and pieces scattered around him. And then, to one side of the room, just next to the phonograph, he noticed something he had never seen before. Who could possibly have left such an enormous package and such a strange one? For while it was not quite square, it was definitely not round. And for its size, it was larger than almost any other big package of smaller dimension that he had ever seen. Attached to one side was a bright blue envelope which said simply, For Milo, who has plenty of time. Of course, if you had ever gotten a surprise package, you can imagine how puzzled and excited Milo was. And if you've never gotten one pay close attention because someday you might. I don't think it's my birthday, he puzzled, and Christmas must be months away, and I haven't been outstandingly good or even good at all. He had to admit that even to himself. Most probably I won't like it anyway, but since I don't know where it came from, I can't possibly send it back. He thought about it for quite a while and then opened the envelope, but just to be polite. One genuine turnpike toll booth, it stated, and then it went on. Easily assembled at home and for use by those who have never traveled in lands beyond. Beyond what? thought Milo as he continued to read. This package contains the following items. One, genuine turnpike toll booth to be erected according to the directions. Three, precautionary signs to be used in a precautionary fashion. Assorted coins for paying tolls. One, map up to date and carefully drawn by master cartographers depicting natural and man-made features. One, book of rules and traffic regulations, which may not be bent or broken. And in smaller letters at the bottom, it concluded, results are not guaranteed, but if not perfectly satisfied, your wasted time will be refunded. Following the instructions, which told him to cut here, lift there, and fold back all around, he soon had the toll booth unpacked and set up on its stand. He fitted the windows in place and attached the roof, which extended out on both sides, and fastened on the coin box. It was very much like the toll booths he had seen many times on family trips, except, of course, it was much smaller and purple. What a strange present, he thought to himself. The least they could have done was to send a highway with it, for it's terribly impractical with that one. 
But since, at the time, there was nothing else he wanted to play with, he set up the three signs. Slow down, approaching toll booth. Please have your fare ready. Have your destination in mind. And slowly unfolded the map. As the announcement stated, it was a beautiful map in many colors, showing principal roads, rivers and seas, towns and cities, mountains and valleys, intersections and detours, and sites of outstanding interest, both beautiful and historic. The only trouble was that Milo had never heard of any of the places it indicated, and even the names sounded most peculiar. I don't think there really is such a country, he concluded after studying it carefully. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. He closed his eyes and poked a finger at the map. Dictionopolis, read Milo slowly when he saw what his finger had chosen. Oh, well, might as well go there as anywhere. He walked across the room and dusted the car off carefully. Then, taking the map and rule book with him, he hopped in and, for lack of anything better to do, drove slowly up to the toll booth. As he deposited his coin and rolled past, he remarked wistfully, I do hope this is an interesting game, otherwise the afternoon will be so terribly dull. Chapter 2. Beyond Expectations Suddenly, he found himself speeding along an unfamiliar country highway, and as he looked back over his shoulder, neither the toll booth nor his room, nor even the house, was anywhere in sight. What had started as make-believe was now very real. What a strange thing to have happen, he thought, just as you might be thinking right now. This game is much more serious than I thought, for here I am riding on a road I'd never seen, going to a place I'd never heard of, and all because of a toll booth which came from nowhere. I'm certainly glad it's a nice day for a trip, he concluded hopefully, for at the moment, this was one thing he definitely knew. The sun sparkled, the sky was clear, and all the colors he saw seemed to be richer and brighter than he could ever remember. The flowers shone as if they had been cleaned and polished, and the tall trees that lined the road shimmered in silvery green. Welcome to expectations, said a carefully lettered sign on the small house at the side of the road. Information, predictions, and advice cheerfully offered. Park here and blow horn. With the first sound from the horn, a little man in a long coat came rushing out from the house, speaking as fast as he could and repeating everything several times. My, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the land of expectations. To the land of expectations. To the land of expectations. We don't get many travelers these days and certainly don't get many travelers these days. Uh, well, what can I do for you? I'm the weatherman. Uh, is this the right road for Dictionopolis? asked Milo, a little bowled over by the effusive greeting. Well now, well now, well now, he began again. I don't know of any wrong road to Dictionopolis, so if this road goes to Dictionopolis, it must be the right road. And if it doesn't, it must be the right road to somewhere else, because there are no wrong roads to anywhere. Do you think it will rain? I thought you were the weatherman, said Milo, very confused. Oh no, said the little man. I'm the weatherman, not the weatherman. For, after all, it's more important to know whether there will be weather than what the weather will be. And with that, he released a dozen balloons that sailed off into the sky. Must see which way the wind is blowing, he said, chuckling over his little joke and watching them disappear in all directions. What kind of place is expectations? inquired Milo, unable to see the humor and feeling very doubtful of the little man's sanity. Good question, good question, he exclaimed. Expectation is the place you must always go before you get where you're going. Of course, some people never go beyond expectations, but my job is to hurry them along, whether they like it or not. Now, what else can I do for you? And before Milo could reply, he rushed into the house and reappeared a moment later with a new coat and an umbrella. I think I can find my own way, said Milo, not at all sure that he could. But since he didn't understand the little man at all, he decided that he might as well move on, at least until he met someone whose sentences didn't always sound as if they would make as much sense backwards as forwards. Splendid, 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 exclaimed the weatherman. Whether or not you find your own way, you're bound to find some way. If you happen to find my way, please return it, as I lost it years ago. I imagine by now it's quite rusty. You did say it was going to rain, didn't you? And with that, he opened an umbrella and looked up nervously. I'm glad you made your own decision. I do hate to make up my mind about anything, whether it's good or bad, up or down, in or out, rain or shine. Expect everything, I always say, and the unexpected never happens. Now please drive carefully. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. His last goodbye was drowned out by an enormous clap of thunder. And as Milo drove down the road in the bright sunshine, he could see the weatherman standing in the middle of a fierce cloudburst that seemed to be raining only on him. 
The road dipped now into a broad green valley and stretched toward the horizon. The little car bounced along with very little effort, and Milo had hardly to touch the accelerator to go as fast as he wanted. He was glad to be on his way again. It's all very well to spend time in expectations, he thought, but talking to that strange man all day would certainly get me nowhere. He's the most peculiar person I've ever met, continued Milo, unaware of how many peculiar people he would shortly encounter. As he drove along the peaceful highway, he soon fell to daydreaming and paid less and less attention to where he was going. In a short time, he wasn't paying any attention at all. And that is why, at a fork in the road, when a sign pointed to the left, Milo went to the right, along a route which looked suspiciously like the wrong way. Things began to change as soon as he left the main highway. The sky became quite gray, and along with it the whole countryside seemed to lose its color and assume the same monotonous tone. Everything was quiet, and even the air hung heavily. The birds sang only gray songs, and the road wound back and forth in an endless series of climbing curves. Mile after mile after mile after mile he drove and now gradually the car went slower and slower until it was hardly moving at all it looks as though i'm getting nowhere yawned milo becoming very drowsy and dull i hope i haven't taken a wrong turn mile after mile after mile after mile and everything became grayer and more monotonous finally the car just stopped altogether and hard as he tried It wouldn't budge another inch. I wonder where I am, said Milo in a very worried tone. You're in the doldrums, wailed a voice that sounded far away. He looked around quickly to see who had spoken. No one was there, and it was as quiet and still as one could imagine. Yes, the doldrums, yawned another voice, but still he saw no one. What are the doldrums? He cried loudly and tried very hard to see who would answer this time. The doldrums, my young friend, are where nothing ever happens and nothing ever changes. This time the voice came from so close that Milo jumped with surprise for sitting on his right shoulder so lightly that he hardly noticed was a small creature, exactly the color of his shirt. Allow me to introduce all of us, the creature went on. We are the Lethargerians at your service. Milo looked around and for the first time noticed dozens of them, sitting on the car, standing in the road, and lying all over the trees and the bushes. They were very difficult to see because whatever they happened to be sitting on or near was exactly the color they happened to be. Each one looked very much like the other, except for the color, of course, and some looked even more like each other than they did like themselves. Uh, I'm very pleased to meet you, said Milo, not sure whether he was pleased at all. I think I'm lost. Can you help me, please? Oh, don't say think, said one sitting on his shoe, for the one on his shoulder had fallen asleep. It's against the law. And he yawned and fell off to sleep, too. No one's allowed to think in the doldrums, continued a third, beginning to doze off. And as each one spoke, he fell off to sleep, or another picked up the conversation with hardly any interruption. Don't you have a rule book? It's local ordinance 175389J. Milo quickly pulled the rule book from his pocket, opened the page, and read Ordinance 175389J. It shall be unlawful, illegal, and unethical to think. Think of thinking, surmise, presume, reason, meditate, or speculate while in the doldrums. Anyone breaking this law shall be severely punished. That's a ridiculous law, said Milo, quite indignantly. Everybody thinks. We don't, shouted the Lethargerians all at once. And most of the time you don't, said a yellow one sitting in a daffodil. That's why you're here. You weren't thinking, and you weren't paying attention either. People who don't pay attention often get stuck in the doldrums. And with that, he toppled out of the flower and fell snoring into the grass. Milo couldn't help laughing at the little creature's strange behavior, even though he knew it might be rude. Stop that at once, ordered the plaid one clinging to a stocking. Laughing is against the law. Don't you have a rule book? It's local ordinance 574381W. Opening the book again, Milo found ordinance 574381W. 
In the doldrums, laughter is frowned upon and smiling is permitted only on alternate Thursdays. Violators shall be dealt with most harshly. Well, if you can't laugh or think, what can you do? asked Milo. Anything as long as it's nothing, and everything as long as it isn't anything, explained another. There's lots to do. We have a very busy schedule. At eight o'clock we get up, and then we spend from eight to nine daydreaming. From nine to nine thirty we take our early mid-morning nap. From nine thirty to ten thirty we dawdle and delay. From ten thirty to eleven thirty we take our late early morning nap. From eleven thirty to twelve we bide our time and then eat lunch. From one to two we linger and loiter. From two to three we take our early afternoon nap. From two thirty to three thirty we put off for tomorrow what we could have done today. From three thirty to four o'clock we take our early afternoon nap. From four to five we loaf and lounge until dinner. From six to seven we dilly dally. From seven to eight, we take our early evening nap, and then for an hour before we go to bed at nine, we waste time. As you can see, that leaves almost no time for brooding, lagging, plodding, or procrastinating. And if we stop to think or laugh, we'd never get nothing done. Y you mean you'd never get anything done? Corrected Milo. We don't want to get anything done. Snapped another angrily. We want to get nothing done, and we can do that without your help. You see, continued another in a more conciliatory tone. It's really quite strenuous doing nothing all day. So once a week, we take a holiday and go nowhere, which was just where we were going when you came along. Would you care to join us? <sighs> I might as well, thought Milo. That's where I seem to be going anyway. Tell me," he yawned, for he felt ready for a nap now himself. "Does everyone here do nothing? Everyone but the terrible watchdog," said two of them, shuddering in chorus. "He's always sniffing around to see that nobody wastes time. Who a most unpleasant character!" "The watchdog," said Milo quizzically. "The watchdog!" shouted another, fainting from fright, for racing down the road, barking furiously and kicking up a great cloud of dust, was the very dog of whom they had been speaking. Run! Wake up! Run! Here he comes! The watchdog! Great shouts filled the air as the lethargarians scattered in all directions and soon disappeared entirely. Ruff! exclaimed the watchdog as he dashed up to the car, loudly puffing and panting. Milo's eyes opened wide. For there in front of him was a large dog with a perfectly normal head, four feet and a tail, and the body of a loudly ticking alarm clock. What are you doing here? growled the watchdog. Just killing time, replied Milo apologetically. You see, killing time, roared the dog so furiously that his alarm went off. It's bad enough wasting time without killing it. And he shuddered at the thought. Why are you in the doldrums anyway? Don't you have anywhere to go? I was on my way to Dictionopolis when I got stuck here," replied Milo. "Can you help me? Help you? You must help yourself," the dog replied, carefully winding himself with his left hind leg. "I suppose you know why you got stuck." "I guess I just wasn't thinking," said Milo. "Precisely!" shouted the dog as his alarm went off again. "Now you know what you must do." I'm afraid I don't," admitted Milo, feeling quite stupid. "Well," continued the watchdog impatiently, "since you got here by not thinking, it seems reasonable to expect that in order to get out, you must start thinking." And with that, he hopped into the car. "Do you mind if I get in? I love automobile rides." Milo began to think as hard as he could, which was very difficult since he wasn't used to it. He thought of birds that swim and fish that fly. He thought of yesterday's lunch and tomorrow's dinner. He thought of words that began with J and numbers that end in three. And as he thought, the wheels began to turn. We're moving! We're moving! He shouted happily. Keep thinking! Scolded the watchdog. The little car started to go faster and faster as Milo's brain whirled with activity, and down the road they went. 
In a few moments, they were out of the doldrums and back on the main highway. All the colors had returned to the original brightness, and as they raced along the road, Milo continued to think of all sorts of things, of the many detours and wrong turns that were so easy to make, of how fine it was to be moving along, and most of all, of how much could be accomplished with just a little thought. And the dog, his nose in the wind, just sat back, watchfully ticking. Milo is sure off to a strange start to this new adventure, isn't he? Remember how Milo started to feel when he got stuck in the doldrums? He started to feel like the lethargarians that lived there. He got tired out. He started not wanting to do anything or think about anything, and he was stuck like that until talk showed up. Have you ever felt like you were stuck in the doldrums too? What kind of things can you think about or do next time you get stuck in the doldrums that will help you get moving again? What do you think of Tok, the watchdog, so far? You'll see a lot more about him in the upcoming chapters. Please feel free to comment your answers or anything else you found interesting about the book so far. Uh, and let us know what you think. And don't forget to tune in next week where we will pick up where we left off of the Phantom Tollbooth. Bye.